Good morning. morning. And welcome to worship today on this beautiful Sunday morning in Raleigh, North Carolina. I was telling some folks earlier, we just needed to be a few degrees colder and it would just be all snow. Wouldn't that be great? It's wonderful to have you here. You all get extra stars for making it out in this wonderful weather. And we're glad, especially if you're visiting with us today, we welcome you and hope you find in this time of worship an encounter with the living, loving God. Uh, I'd invite everyone, if you would, take a minute and sign the fellowship pads that are located on the center aisle of your pew. Let me mention a couple of announcements that are on your purple inserts to highlight them for your attention. We will be back to having Wednesday Night Live this Wednesday. Um, it'll be uh, this, yeah, this, this Wednesday, and it'll be in preparation for thinking about uh, a special event we're going to do in February uh, related to Mardi Gras uh, and things. So we hope you'll be able to come. Uh, there's a sign up there in the bulletin for, for dinner. We hope you can plan. It helps the fellowship committee in planning for food if you're able to sign up ahead of time. So we look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. The session has called the annual congregational meeting uh, for next Sunday. Um, after at the close right after the morning worship service uh, the purpose of that meeting uh, is to receive the budget for 2023 to receive reports uh, from different ministry uh, teams and committees and to also approve changes in the minister's terms of call for 2023 information for the meeting that we will be preparing will be going out um, this week through a separate email, through electronic form, and we'll post it on our social media as well as far as reports and things. If you would like a paper copy or a hard copy of that, let us know in the office and we'll be happy to have those available. We'll also have some available next Sunday for the meeting. And the other thing to just put on your calendar and plan for ahead of time is the first Friday in February, on February the 3rd. Uh, the Fellowship, Com Fellowship Committee is planning a family movie night uh, and you'll see details about that in the insert. That's a great opportunity to invite uh, neighbors and friends uh, to something fun here at Western Boulevard. So take note of that and consider how we can all participate coming up. You'll see other things happening in the life of our church. I trust you can take note of that. Let's continue our worship now. I invite Susan to lead us in our call to worship. Please stand for the call of worship. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. Come, let us worship the Lord our God. Let us kneel before the Lord our God.
Let us confess our sins before God, the source of our freedom and forgiveness. Let us pray. Almighty God, we confess that we have not been faithful to you in our thoughts and actions. We have been selfish in our desires and quarrelsome in our relationships. We have allowed fear to divide us from those who seem different and let distrust separate us from our brothers and sisters. Shine your light into our darkened hearts. Save us from our divisive ways. Unite us in the same mind as Jesus Christ, who dwells with you and the Holy Spirit in perfect harmony. Amen. God offers forgiveness to those who turn to God in true repentance. Therefore, let us trust in God, who breaks the bonds of our oppression and covers our mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And as the Lord has forgiven us, let us also forgive one another and share the peace of Christ with one another, saying, the peace of Christ be with you. So with you. with you. Peace be with you, Joanne. May be seated. I would like to invite the children to come up and join me for a couple minutes together. We're going to stay standing for a minute. How's it going? How's it going? Good, good. I, I'm glad to see none of you have shorts on today. That's good. I know, Pierce, I know you wish you had shorts on, but, but we're good. So I thought today we'd do something different. Um, do y'all, do y'all, have you ever played the, the game Simon Says? Yes. Yes. Okay. So you all stand up here and I'm going to stand back here. Okay. So Simon Says, raise your right hand. Simon Says, raise your left hand. Simon Says, wave your hands around. Stop doing it. Oh, some of you did. <laughs> okay, uh, put your hands. Simon says, put your hands down. Simon says, jump on left leg. <laughs> jump on your right leg. I didn't. I didn't say Simon says, did I? Yeah. 
Simon says stop, because Simon is tired. Okay. Um, Simon says flap your arms around. Simon says praise God. Say praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Stop saying praise God. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, good, good. Okay, Simon says stop. Sit down. <laughs> what were we doing there? What were you, what were you doing? What, did, what were you doing? You were following me, right? Ha ha. You were following directions. You were following what was going on. Do we like to follow directions? No. Not always. <laughs> Most of the time, but not always. Yeah, sometimes. What is it like if someone tells you to follow and you go somewhere maybe you've not been before? What's that like? To f fun? It's exciting. Any other feelings? Is it maybe a little, a little scary? Afraid? Uncertain? Yeah, it just depends on where we are. I remember I've been, there have been times when I have, um, like I've been on a tour, like in a place that I've never been before, and I didn't know where we were going. I just followed the tour guide and just trusted that I, that the person knew where we were going and wouldn't put us in any danger. Sometimes we have ex experiences like that in life where we just follow someone and wait to see what happens. The reason I did, I did our Simon Says and other things is that today we're going to hear a story where Jesus comes along and tells some people to follow him. Do you know who those people were? Who they might have been? They were some of the first disciples. And he comes along, and do you remember what the disciples, what, what they did for a living? Do you remember what they did? Yeah, they were fishermen. They fished, they went out, and they were, so they're in their boats by the lake shore. And he walks along the lake shore, and he says, I want you to drop your nets, and I want you to follow me. And if I was in that situation, that would be kind of hard to do. I have to be honest, just to leave behind what I had known and always done. But they did. They dropped what they were doing and they followed him. And I guess that's a reminder I'm, I take from that for us today, that God wants us to follow Jesus, wants us to follow wherever Jesus leads us. Sometimes that's to places that are well known. Sometimes it might be to something new that we've never experienced before. But in all of those things, God wants us to follow and to trust. And so for me, I appreciate that as we think about that story today. So the next time you play Simon Says, you can think about crazy Pastor Frank telling you to do different things, okay? And how we follow directions and how we follow God. Good. Let's say a prayer together. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. And we thank you for the call that you give to each of us to follow you. No matter where that may be because we always know that when we're following you, you are with us, and you will give us strength and comfort and guidance along the way. Be with us throughout this week as we seek to follow your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. The congregation says? What do we say? Very good. I'll let you head back. I see Mr. Will back there for, children and, for Children's Chapel, if any of you want to go for that. I hope you have a great week, okay? Oh, that's okay. You can go back with your family. Let's pray. Loving God, illumine our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, that our eyes may see your kingdom, that our ears may hear the call of Jesus, and our hearts may know the joy of your salvation. Amen. We hear the good news today from the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 12 to 23. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the lake, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, 
so that what he had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, the light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. So immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I was driving over to the church one evening this past week, and I took the belt line and to come over from the east side and then turn left on Melbourne Road. And when I got to the stop sign at Melbourne and Kaplan, something caught my eye. The house right in front of me on Kaplan still had all of their Christmas lights out, uh, the decorations out on their lawn. And I, I don't know if they still have them. This was like on Tuesday or Wednesday, but I don't know if any of you noticed that as well. And at first, my first reaction, I'll be honest, was a little judgy. It's like, really? You haven't put those away yet? <laughs> but then, then my judgment went away and it turned more to appreciation and actually brought a smile to my face because it was helpful to see those signs of Christmas still up. Uh, and those lights illuminating what was still a very dark night. You know, for most of us, maybe not all of us, but for most of us, the decorations have been put away. The poinsettias are gone, the sanctuary here, it's all back to, back to normal. Um, and we're several w weeks away from the beginning of Lent and a couple months away from Easter Sunday. And in the liturgical calendar, the church calls this period of time ordinary time. And the simplest way to know that you're in ordinary time is that you see green on the pulpit. That's how you can know that. David Toole writes, ordinary time is ordinary in part because of what it is not. It's not Advent or Christmas or Lent or Easter. It's not, therefore, the time during which the church is engaged in preparation for or celebrations of the birth, the death, or the resurrection of Jesus. Ordinary time is also ordinary because of what it is. It's the liturgical season that makes up most of our time. 33 or 34 Sundays of every year, depending on the dates of Epiphany and Easter. It's the time during which we are called, like Peter and Andrew in this passage from Matthew, to follow Jesus. Not because of the star that announced his birth, nor yet because of the excitement conjured up by the promise of a trip to Jerusalem, but simply because Jesus said, follow me. Ordinary time. It's the time between extraordinary. It's the time filled with the mundane, with the routine, with the normal. It's the time filled with meetings and deadlines and illness and stress. 
It's the time filled with life, which perhaps is why we look forward to those extraordinary times like Christmas and Easter, as they maybe give us a break from the ordinary. But it's in this ordinary time that we predominantly live and out of which we receive the call of God. The call of Jesus to follow him doesn't exclusively come in the midst of great celebrations or special seasons of the year. It predominantly comes during the ordinary times, the routines of daily living, the moments that, no, that on the surface seem far from transformative. And yet, even in those most ordinary of moments, our Lord calls and says, follow me. Indeed, Jesus issues this first call to his disciples, not out of joy and exuberance, but out of weariness and anxiety. He has just come out of his wilderness temptation experience, spending 40 days being tempted by the devil. And upon that physical and spiritual challenge, he then receives news that John the Baptist has been arrested. John was like a brother to him, the one who baptized Jesus in the River Jordan. Jesus must have been both physically and emotionally drained at that moment. And in fact, the word used in our translation is that he withdrew to Galilee. Who would have blamed him? if he had wished to withdraw from these difficult circumstances. But he doesn't. And Matthew reminds us that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's prophecy. The Gospel writer quotes the ninth chapter of Isaiah, a scripture that we last read when? On Christmas Eve. As Isaiah spoke of a people whose lives were illumined by the coming of the Messiah's light, so Jesus goes to the same land in Capernaum and begins to spread that light. And in his interpretation of Isaiah's prophecy, Matthew has in mind two groups who are to hear, see, and be transformed by this light. The people who walked in darkness are, for Matthew, the Jewish people who have been waiting for that Messiah. It is to Jews that Jesus primarily came to redeem them and save them from their oppression. But in the midst of this prophecy is also the phrase, Galilee of the Gentiles. Such a reference foreshadows what Jesus will tell his disciples from a mountaintop in Galilee, to go and make disciples of all nations, including those who are not Jews. The light of the world is, is for all people, and that light will call on all to follow him. After this reflection by Matthew on Jesus as the fulfillment of Isaiah, a sharp turn is made in the tone. The message that the light of the world has to share, it's not something that's complacent or benign. It's a call that interrupts the world, barges in on our routines, and jolts us with its emphasis. Matthew writes, From that time Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The Messiah's coming is here, the kingdom of God is very close, and the light illumines the darkness of our lives, showing us where we need to change and follow on a new path. And that abruptness continues when Jesus seeks out his very first disciples. He's walking along the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus saw Simon Peter and Andrew casting their nets out into the sea. Without an introduction, without a, a greeting, without a, pardon me, can I talk to you about something? Without warning, Jesus issues his call. Follow me and I will make you fish for people. And later on, in a similar way, he happened across James and John and called to them that they might follow him as well. Just like that, the call has infiltrated people's lives without any previous warning. 
we all have our definitions of discipleship. To accept Jesus' principles of living, to further the life of the church, and so on. But what Matthew wants his readers to hear is that we are not to admire him or accept his principles, not even to accept him maybe yet as our personal Savior, but only and most importantly to follow him. That's the model of discipleship we're called to emulate, to follow the one who speaks God's word to us. That is how one becomes a believer, a disciple of Christ, by the power of Jesus' word that generates faith in your heart. Once we have heard that word, we're called, we are led to respond to that call. And that's just what Simon Peter and Andrew and James and John do. They follow Jesus without question, without objection. They didn't ask Jesus, where are we going? Or how long do I need to take off from work? Or how much is this going to cost? Or how is this going to affect my previous commitments on my schedule? Without knowing the destination, the end result, the means by which they would get there, without looking ahead, they simply put one foot in front of the other and answer Jesus' call. Why? Because in that call, God spoke to them. And Jesus calls us in a similar manner today. He calls us in the midst of our busy, mundane, ordinary lives, saying, follow me. He calls us when we are exuberant and high on life, saying, follow me. He calls us when we are sad and lonely or despondent, saying, follow me. He calls us when we are confident, and he calls us when we are afraid, saying, follow me. He calls us when we are at peace with our neighbor, and he calls us when we are in conflict with one another, saying, follow me. He calls us when we are faithful, and he calls us when we doubt, saying, follow me. Throughout, through the baptismal waters, the Lord is always issuing his call to us, follow me. Earlier I mentioned that Jesus issued this call to his first disciples out of a place of weariness and exhaustion. For after he heard the news of John's arrest, he withdrew to Galilee. I don't know about you, but a lot of times after receiving difficult news or experiencing stress and anxiety, I just want to withdraw from everything. We all know what that feels like. We hear that someone has died, and we want to withdraw to a time without grief. We experience a crisis that is on top of all of the other constant stresses of life, and we want to withdraw to a space that is free of anxiety. We witness changes happening at a dizzying pace, and we want to withdraw to that nostalgic time when life didn't seem so chaotic. Those are all options that we can choose, to be sure. But usually, those don't change the underlying reality we are living in and through. We might withdraw temporarily from one thing or another, but that grief, that stress, that challenge will still be waiting for us when we reemerge from our withdrawal. What gives us hope and comfort is that our Lord is with us in those very times. In Jesus' call to follow him is the recognition 
that God is with us in all times of life, when times are good and when times are hard. The call of discipleship emanates from a place that is real and is authentic and meets people wherever they are. For that was how Jesus called his followers in his earthly ministry. So the question for us is, how will we answer the Lord's call? Will we hear it clearly amid all the noise of life? Or will it get lost in the chaos of so many voices that we constantly hear? Will we respond to our Savior's call with love and grace and hope? Or will we minimize our Savior's call as just too hard or just too difficult? Will we wait only for the Lord's call when we're up on those mountaintop experiences of life? Or will we believe that Christ's call comes during all times, even during the ordinary times, and recognize that we are following him every moment of every day? We are blessed to be on this earth. How will you respond to the call of God by the light of the world? Will you hesitate and wait, or will you drop what you are doing and immediately see where he takes you? May God be with each of us as we answer the call of God in our lives. Thanks be to God. Amen. In response to God's call and God's word, let us affirm our faith using the words of the a brief statement of faith that you'll find printed in your bulletin. Let us say together what we believe. 
We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. Amen. You may be seated. Come now to a time in our service when we lift up to God our joys and concerns that are on our hearts and minds. I have a number that I would like to share with you, and then I, I see Steve is, will have a microphone available. If you have a prayer concern or joy you'd like to share, just raise your hand and he'll bring the microphone to you, and then Terrence is going to lead us in our prayer. Let me share with you those some concerns and joys that I'm aware of. Um, we especially remember today Dean and Sandy Irving's son, Tyrell, who has been hospitalized this past week dealing with high blood pressure. So our prayers are with him and pray that he is able to be discharged very soon. Our prayers are with Carolyn Pittman. Carolyn had back surgery this past week and it was successful and she is recuperating at home, but our prayers continue to be with her and Ronnie as she recuperates. We remember um, Mac Winslow and Blythe Clifford have asked that we remember two dear friends of theirs who have experienced either illness or loss this past week. Maggie and Karsten DeLapp had the tragedy of their one-year-old daughter dying this past week. And she was at the daycare that she was being cared for. And so our prayers are with Maggie and Karsten as they deal with this devastating loss. And they also ask prayers for Julie Lopez, who was a dear friend who had a liver transplant five years ago uh, due to an autoimmune disease. But now that liver is failing and she is in need of another transplant and she's dealing with a serious infection. Um, I would invite us also to keep in our prayers Lou Jean Hemphill, who has been a longtime member of our church, who is now staying and living with her granddaughter uh, in the Mebane and Burlington area. Uh, Lou Jean is dealing with dementia, and it is a, it's been a very difficult thing. And they are also dealing with her son, Dan, who is also dealing with cancer. Um, if you would like to reach out to Lou Jean. What her granddaughter suggested, which I think is a wonderful idea, is to send her a card, but to send with the card a picture of yourself. And that will help her in hopefully recognizing who the words are from and helping her with that. And if you want that information, her we sent this out through the prayer chain a few weeks ago, but if you need that contact information, we'll be happy to provide that uh, through the office. So please let us know. And then we learned last night of another mass shooting in our country, of over 10 people killed in the Los Angeles area and more than 10 injured. Um, and so our prayers are with that community and with our country as we continue to struggle with that. And then finally, I would just like to share, we shared this past week uh, the news that uh, Elizabeth Davis Everhart is gonna be finishing her work with us the end of January. And I'm grateful that James is here as well. We, we are. Our prayers are with both of you as they prepare for a new move um, later this, this year as James takes a new position in Savannah, Georgia. And we'll be celebrating Elizabeth next Sunday, but we know you all are in our prayers as you go through that time of transition. And we're, and, and we're grateful you're moving somewhere even warmer than here. And hopefully you won't have to deal with this. Amen. Amen. I hear an amen from the choir. <laughs> are there others whom you had mentioned that we might be aware of them today? Okay, hearing none, I'll let Terrence lead us in our prayer. Needs of our world, and your salvation offers hope to the lost. Therefore, we pray for our world and our community. For your holy church, we pray that all the baptized may live in harmony with one another. 
And we pray that our pastors and teachers may be wise and gracious ministers of the gospel. God, we pray for the world and all who suffer from the rod of oppression. Break the yoke of violence and free all people from the burden of war and domestic strife. We pray, God, for the leaders of the nations, that they may be just and faithful in their duty and serve the good of all creation. God, we pray for those who suffer disease of body and of mind, that they may know the power of your healing grace. We pray for those who have died and for those who will die today, that they may find eternal rest. And for those who care for the dying, that they may find peace and comfort. Now I invite us all to remember silently those who are sick and shut in. Let us remember those who are oppressed and depressed, bound and burdened, broken and bereaved. Let us remember now silently the least, the lost, and the left out. For those concerns we have named out loud, God, and for those who come to our minds in this time of silence, hear, O oh Lord, the cries of your people. Be gracious to us and answer us. For you are our salvation through Christ who taught us how to pray. By saying together, our Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. In response to God's love and God's word to us this day, let us offer to God our lives and the gifts which we bring.
God of our salvation, receive these gifts that we offer and bless them for the work of your kingdom. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Friends, go from this place in peace, trust, and serve the Lord. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you now and always. Amen. Amen.